Welcome to the lecture 20 of this uh, learning about learning uh, lecture series. We started off this um, uh, lecture series uh, with the idea of uh, uh, with the promise of saying we will look into the learning and memory in um, living organisms and what are all the various different factors that affect the learning and our ability to uh, retrieve these uh, memories that are stored in response to the um, learning, the act of learning. Um, we have come to the point where we have uh, we have um, showed that one can trace these uh, aspects of uh, learning as well as the memory formation all the way down to the molecules. The examples are uh, how the dopamine levels can actually modulate your behavior, expression of your behavior um, uh, and how um, a particular class of receptors, NMDR receptors. Uh, presence and absence of them in a small region of the brain, a small sub region of the brain in fact can uh, modulate your ability to form an associative memory and um, uh, that is the NMDR um, knockout and uh, while um, type uh, study that we talked about and then uh, come all the way to the point where you can remove a particular gene that too in a differential amount when you do that the effects that you see are very very uh, profound uh, when you re remove them a uh, lot then you lose your ability to um, form and maintain that memory for a long time i mean uh, you, you, the memory doesn't get formed at all on the other hand when you re uh, remove them in partially then the recent memory seems to be okay but your ability to uh, remember for a longer period of time seems to be affected and we said that that um, this is um, because of the nature of the memories and what happens to them as we um, live uh, and as it evolves in time. Quickly though the model uh, that we proposed is that initially the uh, for the memory uh, the in initially the informations are getting integrated at the hippocampus to form a representation or an event and that is uh, that is a memory that is staying in hippocampus itself when you retrieve them in, uh, very initially that is where you are retrieving it from and if you remove the hippocampus you cannot integrate it and definitely you are not forming that uh, memory so th that is uh, you, you so called the sheet of memory is hippocampus and if you remove them you do not form that memory at all. However, if you wait sufficiently long enough and then remove it even though you lose your ability to form any new memories you can still retrieve it the notion we put forward why we can why it is so is because in due course of time the cortical mod modules that actually took part in the formation of the in memory initially uh, can wire together by themselves with assistance from some other regions or some other cortical regions but essentially in a um, can form uh, an integrated representation outside of a hippocampus and such that if you remove the hippocampus you can still retrieve the aspects of memory that uh, was that is old. We also said that such memories are distinct in their characters um, we did that through discrimination task. Now I want to bring here a important dif uh, distinction between two processes of consolidation. See the definition of consolidation is about making the memory resistant to external interferences such that they can be robustly retrieved after a certain time. It turns out you can intervene in this process by which the memories become um, um, resistant to change in two different time scales. One time scale we already know that is the protein synthesis dependent pathway that is the, what we call it as cellular level consolidation alright. 
So, now that process you can think of that as uh, uh, represented through here that there is an external input that is coming into the neurons and the neurons respond by changing what is now known as a protein interactome that is that they are actually you need proteins to be made and the proteins are uh, made and you have can have regulation of this uh, process at multiple levels at the level of transcription, translation and post translational modification too. Each one of these processes cell biological processes right each one of these processes can modulate the neuronal function thereby modulate the memory the expression of memory. But the key here is that if these processes were to happen these need to be mediated by somebody all right. So, this can happen um, such that it can happen at overall network level, but ev eventually the net result is the behavioral output right, but the that behavioral output needs to be modulated by somebody and that is um, where we are going to introduce a new class of a uh, class of genes called immediate early genes. These are the genes that are first response genes or they start this process of de novo protein synthesis. They help or they assist in this um, protein interactome that we talked about ok. Based on how they actually assist you can call them as you can classify them as two different categories affectors and effectors uh, essentially uh, you say uh, you classify them based on whether they play an instructive role. Instructive role is pretty much like a class teacher or a tutor telling you what to do is he is instructing. So, his the person is going to tell you that ok do this. So, that these genes send a signal for subsequent um, uh, cellular processes versus a permissive role where it is an active participation from in a process that the, a process that helps in memory formation. So, you would say these guys are you can call them as affectors because they affect while these guys can are called as effectors. So, based on this you can classify the IEGs as affectors and effectors. Now, what do they do? First these are the genes as I was telling these are the genes uh, whose uh, transcription per se is controlled by patterned synaptic activity that is um, correlated to cos LTP all right. So, when whenever you are uh, inducing an LTP you are activating these genes all right they are very very highly correlated, but it is uh, independent of the proteins the nova protein synthesis because this is a first response um, elements. So, they do come in before. So, that uh, the control can happen later on that the prevention of the um, protein formation can happen later on. And more importantly the mechanisms that you can think of which can trigger this is that the calcium influx which in turn is detected by kinases. We talked about um, chem kinase 2 that is not the only kinase there are many other kinases, but uh, um, chem kinase 2 is uh, the one that we talked about. So, once the kinases they get activated they trigger um, nuclear gene expression which in turn triggers the um, expression of the transcription factors such as CREB and SRF. So, these uh, members themselves can then trigger subsequent uh, synthesis of proteins the net result being that you end up generating molecules that result in enhanced neurotransmission either across the synapse or in terms of uh, cellular level response for a given input. When that happens you say that the you have a formation of a memory or alteration of a behavior. While uh, many of the labs uh, 
are deeply interested in understanding and unraveling the various mechanisms that I have listed out and um, saying what roles each of the members play, what uh, people in uh, gen generally in the um, memory field people do is that they make use of these findings to ask questions to probe the, uh, ex the memory encoding and the expression of the memory process in a deeper way. How do we do that? We know that these are the first response elements, particularly these are the first response elements um, when there is a pattern synaptic activity that is highly correlated or highly known to, uh, to be capable of inducing LTP, right. So, if you want to know which are the um, neurons that actually took part in this uh, LTP for example, highly likely right. We are talking about correlation, so we are talking about highly like high um, likelihood not uh, necessarily uh, direct relationship right. So, um, in a, uh, if you want to ask that you can actually go ahead and find out which of these neurons actually are expressing this IEGs or in other ways you can make use of this phenomena as it was done at in the regimen et al to really mark those neurons which take part in memory. How did they do that? They make use of they made use of um, a transgenic and um, these are mice where you have put in an external gene and that has become part of its um, genome. So, you, uh, when, when the mice is breeding it is uh, passed along and then it expresses the protein depending on uh, during the herit uh, inheritance if it, that gene is passed along or not. Now, what is that gene? Uh, this has two genes, one is um, FOS promoter, this is an IEG here, um, there are various different classes of IEGs I told you and there are different members and FOS, CFOS particularly is one of those IEGs and this we have taken the promoter of that gene and then they have expressed a molecule called TTA ok. Let us not worry about the name, but uh, what, uh, what is important here is that what it does this in turn can actually bind to another promoter which is also expressed as a transgene and only if this guy binds this enables this promoter to get activated and then express a protein called LAGZ. Now, the beautiful part about this whole process is that this whole binding is uh, can be inhibited by the presence of doxycycline a drug that can be externally administered. So, now what you have is a possibility wherein you actually can administer the drug and keep this neuron not express this protein at all, laxy at all. See this is very very important because all if since this is a transgenic mice they are having this from their birth and throughout its birth at various different points in time this neuron would have inf uh, received information would have taken part in memory. So, if if not for this doxycycline drug if you actually go, go into the brain and then with the hope of actually tracing or identifying the neuron what you will see is that the whole brain almost the whole brain would be labeled with laxy because at some point or the other this neuron would have received the information and would have taken part in uh, memory. So, now what this doxycycline provides is that an opportunity for you to prevent that. So, if you feed this uh, mice with the doxycycline, now that doxycycline goes and then inhibits the binding of TTA to this um, gene as a result none of the neurons end up expressing LAGZ. So, in this stage they took this mice and then trained them in fair conditioning. Once they have been trained they removed the mice of the doxycycline. The idea here is now the event has happened. I need to mark those neurons that took part in memory that took that actually expressed CFOS because CFOS um, would have been expressed because of the um, in first as a first information response and the neurons that received this shock information and the context information and the tone information would have um, 
probably express this if us I would like to actually um, label them and that is why I we removed that uh, doxycycline and this helps you to tag those neurons that received this information and decided to take part in plasticity formation. The beauty of this is now you can feed the mice back with the doxycycline. When do we do that? We know that the consolidation window the protein synthesis dependent consolidation window is 24 hours remember 6 hours and later to be safe 24 hours and later we know it is cellular consolidation is done. So, I am going to keep this window open only for 24 hours and after that I start giving doxycycline. Now, no more expression of lag Z, no more response um, of the FOS promoter activated TTA and then expression of lag Z. What you have now given is that you have labeled the neurons that took part in the um, memory formation in response to fear conditioning experiment once and for all in the mice's life. They went ahead and asked probe this in various different ways and showed it is really the memory trace, but the point of interest why I am mentioning here is that you can use this in along with something else in a more exciting way to probe the behavior of an animal what that would be. See if it were to be the neural uh, uh, trace that these animals are uh, the memory trace that these animals are um, getting labeled then I should be able to go and activate those neurons and be able to reenact the memory right that is the notion right that is the idea of um, zeroing in on the uh, memory where the substrate of the memory right. So, can I do that? You know that we can label this supposedly memory encoding neurons, but how do I go ahead and activate them and them alone? This required another technology uh, to uh, so to speak that is the optically activatable channels ion channels. So, regular ion channels as we know they actually help in uh, neural conduction right. The, um, um, they open and close um, and then depending on their open and close states they let the ions in or out depending on the kind of channels they are. So, now the special property of these channels are the called the channel rhodopsins are is that that uh, they op they go between the closed and open state depending on the light. When you shine a particular wavelength of a light in this case blue light it is 488 nanometer light when you do that when you shine that the ion channel opens letting in sodium along with it calcium 2 cation come in that is sufficient enough to trigger an action potential. It is as if that the neuron is re has received an information it is responding to that right. It, you um, So, the bottom bars here are the instances where the light is on you can clearly see the light uh, the neural response. Now, let us put this together with the fact that we can actually label the neurons that could have taken part in memory formation. That is what um, Susumutonangava's group at MIT did they took this mice um, where the mice were expressing CFOS in response I mean uh, resp uh, expressing TTA in response to CFOS very much like the previous paper, but they also injected they coupled with a different uh, probe here and like uh, uh, them they were not in uh, they were not using a lag Z as a indicator they were actually using an AAV virus a virus uh, which can actually deliver a particular kind of a gene. The gene is that of the channel rhodopsin that would express only if the TTA comes and binds to the promoter all right. So, this helps to mark and this helps to activate, but then this will get expressed only if the TTA gets and comes and binds to this that is what this whole um, picture is all about. Now, you can see they did that at uh, dentate gyrus and they uh, what you can see is that there are bunch of neurons here 
both of them expressing both the genes. However, only a fraction of them marked in yellow like this uh, where both these things coincide that is um, the expression of um, I mean the receiving of the information as a result what you see is the expression of the CFOS which is triggering TTA and TTA goes and binds to the promoter TRE which is starting the expression of channel rhodopsin. The idea here is now all this can be controlled with doxycycline remember that. Now the idea here is that I am going to take make use of the system and then train the mice such that I label those neurons that are actually encoding ok. So, what we are uh, what they are doing done is that they have uh, used the doxycycline to prevent the formation of the memory right um, or to prevent the labeling of I mean not formation of the memory to prevent the labeling of the neurons when the animal is exposed to context A, a habituation context. Then they open the window of doxycycline, no doxycycline here. Now the TTA can go ahead and trigger the expression of channel rhodopsin thereby labeling the neurons and then they did fear conditioning for context B. They put back in doxycycline in context A and they are going to test it. Now since it is context A different from context B and it is recent time point the animal should not express any fear and what do they see? I mean you can actually go ahead and see that they are labeling a sub population of the uh, DG neurons that is uh, what is shown in this picture. But um, more importantly when you actually go ahead and ask in the behavior right. So, what do they see is that um, the following. So, they take these animals and put in an optical fiber right because you need to deliver the blue light into its head. So, they put in an optical fiber through which they can actually deliver the blue light at will. So, what they are uh, what we are going to do is that it is since it is in a new context what you see is that when you do not deliver the light the animal do not freeze that is almost the same as that of the habitu um, habituation group right and on the other hand the moment you turn on the light right this are the off on cycles here right. So, the moment you turn on the light you can see the freezing goes up only in those animals that are trained in the context B and labeled in the context B not in the control. You turn off the light it comes back again and turn on it goes back again. All this is happening in a context that is completely neutral context A non training context that is why it can go back to the 0 state. Now, you are making the animal think even though it is in the con different context not in the training context you are making the animal think it is the training context thereby eliciting freezing thereby retrieving its memory and making sure I mean mm, 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 and the expression of that is freezing. Now, this is the state where we have reached now and from the starting point of asking the question of where exactly the memory is located. I hope through these lectures I was able to convince you that learning is a behavior that developed that is uh, developed in response to uh, in the evolutionary response to adapt ourselves to a changing stimuli. And there are rules that one can elucidate under what circumstances we will be able to change and, and what circumstances we will not be able to. And the beauty of this whole process is that you can trace all the way down to individual molecules small molecules and thereby showing that the complex behaviors do have representations at these very simple levels. Not to say that this is the only I mean these are the only factors that matter that is not true, but what I am saying is without them you cannot have 
those complex behaviors and you can go by, go down all the way to this individual molecules. It is very, very fascinating to know that these individual molecules can control that uh, such complex behaviors. In doing so, we have overlooked few of the phenomena um, because it is not an all encompassing lectures. And so, what I will be doing is that in the next lecture, I will be specifically focusing on those phenomena that we have not spent time uh, understanding it right. We, um, to list out, we have not talked about various different behaviors uh, that people use to um, study various different behavioral experiments or behavioral protocols uh, that people use to study um, learning and memory in animals. We have not talked about some of the key learning mechanisms. We talked about associative memory formation, we talked uh, and then particularly the cal uh, classical conditioning and um, operant conditioning. Uh, there is a huge set of literature about um, model based learning and we have not uh, touched up on that at all. And even in the um, class of operant conditioning, we have not talked about the um, we talked only about two kinds of reinforcers, primary and secondary. We did not talk about social reinforcers. And these are the fa uh, few of the phenomena that we will be uh, covering in the next lecture. And hopefully, I will also show you some of the videos of um, how um, these behaviors are carried out and when you carry out, what do you expect to see? Thank you.